Congratulations, YouTube. You did it. You wore me down and you sucked me back in. I have too many subscribers here just to walk away entirely, especially with no alternative that truly stacks up and so many copycat channels uploading my shows for me anyway. But we can't forget the THC's account here is on thin ice. And so the YouTube version of the show has to be prefaced with this little PSA, only to say that episodes that contain the kinds of themes that have been regularly banned on YouTube will not appear here. And even with that precaution, there's already enough in the archive to get us removed, so remember that the higher side chats could be banned or put in timeout again at any time. And I won't be able to tell you guys about it. So if you feel like it's been too long since you've heard from me here on this digital, dystopian, draconian, data mining monster of a police state seeking platform, your first step should be to check the HigherSideChats.com for the latest shows. All right? All right. Enjoy. Brace yourself, because you're about to dive into another free first hour episode of the Higher Side Chats. And we just want to let you know that whether you're looking for a companion through your paranoid insomnia, entertaining yourself through one of life's mundane activities, or trying to ward off the internal screams of all those sad, smothered souls around the office, THC is here. And you should know that every episode of the Higher Side Chats has an entire second hour for Plus members. Sign up at thehiresidechats.com and you'll get years of Plus show archives, lifetime forum access, a special invite to Greg Carlwood's monthly joint sessions, MP3s of THC music, bonus episodes, four videos, and 10% off t-shirts, grinders, and whatever else ends up in the Higher Side store. It's $8 a month that you won't miss, so become a Plus member and treat yourself in these troubled times. Always action-packed and commercial-free, which means you'll unfortunately never hear my voice again. In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. Well, we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. Hello again, Higher Side Chatters. From sunny San Diego, I'm Greg Carlwood, and while the rest of the world trades opinions about Twitter's trending topics and anticipates the decree that they can safely return to the familiar comfort of a baseball stadium, today we're going to wade into the hotbed of weirdness that is the Penny Royal Plateau. If you don't know, and I definitely didn't, the Penny Royal is a large area of Kentucky that is home to a great deal of high strangeness activity, abandoned mines, the Mammoth Cave System said to be the largest in the world with an estimated 1,000 miles of underground goodness, and it's all right there at the foothills of the Appalachians thought to be one of the world's oldest mountain ranges. Well, if you spent any sort of time looking into the paranormal, you know that one of the key factors in unraveling many of the mysteries is place. Whether it's ley lines, a potent and emotionally charged history, or anomalous qualities to the landscape, when people have high strangeness encounters, we should pay extra attention to where they are. And with the rich quartz crystal concentration, the ancient mountains, the history, the seclusion, and of course the mammoth cave system, this corner of Kentucky is well worth our time. And here to help us take a deep dive into the Pandora's box of paranormal provocativeness that is spilling out of the Penny Royal is Nathan Isaac. Nathan is a lifelong fan of Fortean Phenomena who turned that love into labor and produced the eight-part Penny Royal podcast series that covers a whole host of strange history, activities, sightings, and events in the area, and it is a pleasure to have him here today. The Somerset seeker of high strangeness and Penny Royal podcaster of Pulaski County, Nathan, my man, welcome to the higher side. Thanks, Greg, man. That's awesome, dude. And thanks for having me tonight, man. I'm super excited to talk to you about all this craziness, so. Of course, of course. I'm psyched. It is a pleasure to have you here. I thought your eight-episode Penny Royal podcast was super interesting. So many wild threads to talk about, bizarre stories that get well beyond your typical Bigfoot or Silver Ship sighting. And I didn't want to give too much away there in the intro, so I kept it kind of vague. But to dive into this thing, for people who really have no context at all, what would be a good description of the Penny Royal area and the qualities that make it so unique? I guess what I usually tell people when we're talking about Penny Royal, it's an area 
that goes from the Appalachian Mountains west through central Kentucky, south central Kentucky, to western Kentucky, and then up to the bluegrass region where Lexington is, sort of where all the horse parks are. So this particular region is a karst region, which makes it pretty unique. Lots of sinkholes, lots of caves. The Mammoth Cave system is on the western part of it. And I guess the biggest feature, the strangest feature, and really what kind of started me down the rabbit hole of this whole you know, mystery of this area, was finding out that actually Pulaski County is the center of what NASA calls the Kentucky Anomaly, hmm. right? And so the Kentucky Anomaly is the largest spike of geomagnetic energy in the Western Hemisphere. The reason that I found this out, the way that I found it out, is that I'd, I'd been reading about Sedona. People say now that Sedona is sort of less of a hot spot for UFOs, you know. There's too much tourism, and it's not there anymore. But I love Sedona. That's one of my favorite places. But I was reading about it, and they were having all of these sightings of UFOs. And I'd read about the quartz. There's a, a giant quartz deposit beneath Sedona. And the article I was reading was talking about this really intense geomagnetic field there. And so I thought, you know, I, I can test this out. I can grab some of the satellite imagery. They're called KMZ files that you know NASA and other agencies put out. You can just drop those files onto Google Earth. So I did it, and I thought, let's see if, you know, let's grab the one for geomagnetic intensities. And I dropped it in. And sure enough, Sedona lit up. and an area of southern Alaska. And then this place in the southeastern United States was the most intense. And at the time I was looking at this, I was living in Lexington. I wasn't actually here in Somerset. And when I zoomed all the way in, there it was. It was Pulaski County. It was right in the center of what NASA calls the Kentucky Anomaly. And I thought, this is crazy. And then a few years later, I ended up moving down here with my wife. And I was like, this is crazy, you know. At the time, I didn't know all the other weirdness that's associated with it. But what you find out is that this entire region, that that geomagnetic energy centers on Pulaski County. It's so intense that the gravity here in this area is different. Like when you look at the NASA maps, they have an actual gravity well map. And Pulaski County's gravity is slightly different than the surface gravity around it, which is strange, you know. Yeah. But when you look at the entire Penny Royal Plateau, one thing to note is that the westernmost reaches of it, like I said, it's Mammoth Cave, but it's also Hopkinsville, where the Hopkinsville goblins are. Right. It's also Edgar Casey is from Hopkinsville. Hmm. And then there's a lot of UFO sightings. You know, obviously the Mantell sighting, there's the Stanford abductions of the three women in the 1970s. That's just like 30 miles north of here. And just tons of strangeness, lots and lots of Bigfoot sightings, cryptid sightings. And the other thing I will note that I found in the process of researching all of this is that there are a number of Adena mounds, like ancient earthworks from like the Hopewell culture and the Adena culture, they really center on the Ohio River Valley. And that's where the Serpent Mound is. Ashland, Kentucky, where Charles Manson is from. Mm-hmm. <laughs> has, a, has a ton of them. You know, if, if anybody's read Peter Lavenda's Sinister Forces, yes. they'll be familiar with the fact that he played on top of those. So it was a strange thing when I found out that here in Pulaski County, that there was an Adena Mound. And that was one of the areas that a lot of this strangeness centered around. And it's strange, too, because it's located. There's a highway here where a lot of this strangeness occurs at. And it's Highway 39. And if anyone's listened to Penny Royal, Dan Dutton, a famous Kentucky artist, he features prominently in the podcast. And he's a close friend of mine. And once we started digging into this, he was the one that pointed out, you know, Highway 39 is one of the oldest roads in America. You know, it was part of the Great Warrior Way, you know, when they were following buffalo traces. Hmm. 
that's where the name of Buffalo Trace for the bourbon comes from, is that these ancient American tribes were following these buffalo up through their trails. And so one of those roads is Highway 39 that cuts right through here, right past the Adena Mound, right through this intense area. And and then that's the other thing, too. You mentioned the quartz in the intro. This area is just, there's a heavy concentration of quartz. And I think, you know, that a lot of my research, too, about the Sedona sightings and kind of that fed into what we found here was that there's just this weird spike in violence here and, and a history of violence in Pulaski County and in this region, but like extreme violence. And I really wondered, and I still believe that this is true, but I wondered if the intense geomagnetic fields, the intense electromagnetic fields coupled with the quartz, you know, was creating something like a piezoelectric effect or something that was affecting people's minds, you know, brains. There's a high rate of mental illness here that's sort of unexplained. And, you know, that's a favorite story of mine is that, you know, a lot of people that we've talked to that have worked at Eastern State, which is like the largest mental institution in Kentucky, and it's located in Lexington. Anytime you bring up Pulaski County, apparently, to the people that work there, they're like, what's going on down there? Because it, I think the last time we spoke to someone, it was like 70% of the people in there were coming from Pulaski County, which is strange. So it's a weird region, man. And, and it's, it's one of those things, too. You know, that's the thing about the show. You know, that was sort of the goal going into creating Penny Royal. I really wanted to look at the folklore of a place, of this place, and see the relationship between people and place and how place affects the people and how the people affect the place. And this just turned out to be unbelievably weird and like <laughs> it's just, just totally strange man it's just the deeper we dove into this and still yet the deeper we dive into it the weirder and weirder it gets <laughs> and the weird it's just just the stuff we found man i mean you you've listened to the show the shit about guitarma all that stuff is just absolutely nuts yes yes it it does get weird and in terms of this anomaly Do they really have any idea what could be the cause of this, like a comet or meteor impact? Are there other possible suspects as to what's causing this? The only thing, now when you read the NASA research on this, it's lithospheric data, which is data in the crust of the Earth. The idea is that there's some type of deposits deeper in the crust and that the core of the Earth, its magnetic field as it spins, is somehow interacting with those deposits to create this, but that's why it's called the Kentucky Anomaly. You know, NASA really doesn't know why there's such an intense spike here, but there is. I mean, it's so intense that it causes the Van Allen belts to dip slightly toward this area to try to touch that magnetic field, which is strange. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) it's weird, man. (laughs) <laughs> on the subject of why there might be so much weirdness in the area on top of that, Kenneth Grant is one of several people to have suggested the Adena or Hopewell tribes or maybe even ancient humans at an even deeper time depth opened some type of portal in the area that was never closed. And that is a provocative idea. But do you know what they're basing that suggestion on? Yeah, so <laughs> I guess that was one of the strange things, too, that we found. You know, it's like truth is stranger than fiction, right? We had heard, you know, and I'll probably bring this up a few times, but Sinister Forces, you know, Lavinda mentions Grant, and they are talking about the Adena Mounds and, and kind of relating that to Charles Manson and some of this stuff near Ashland. But there's a story amongst the Cherokee, but also with the the Hopewell and the the Adena, that the priest class, that the shamans had opened up a gateway here in this area. Well, in the area of Kentucky, right? From where we are sort of over to Ashland and West Virginia and up to where Cincinnati is. And that they had opened up this gateway, which was a gateway to the night side. And that that gateway was never closed and because of that all of these things have been able to 
penetrate our reality, as it were. Some people say that that's, they talk about the Mothman as being a part of that, but the weird thing that we found, which I absolutely didn't believe that we were going to encounter this, because I'd heard all these stories about cults and, and groups here in the area practicing magic or, or doing nefarious things, which I still discount. You know, I, I don't think that there was any like coordinated group. But what I did find and what's more interesting is that there was a group in Cincinnati of magicians in the 1970s who were led by a woman named Nima, or that was her magical name. I think Maggie Ingalls was her real name. And so she was a practitioner of, I think she was a member of the OTO originally, but she was part of the Typhonian order of Kenneth Grant's group. And she formed this group in Cincinnati called the Bait Cabal. And they were part of a publication called the Cincinnati Journal of Ceremonial Magic. I was lucky enough to get the entire collection. It's absolutely fascinating. But what we found was that she very much believed this concept. And that's really where Kenneth Grant gets his concept of this portal being opened, this gateway being opened here from Nema. And she called it the Cincinnati Vortex, right? And that it stretched down into this area. And, and this is totally unbelievable, you know, when you start to find this stuff, that she and the Bait Cabal and members of the Bait Cabal were coming from Cincinnati down here to Pulaski County on the edge of the Daniel Boone National Forest. And they were performing rituals that they believed because, you know, Kenneth Grant and the Bait Cabal and some of these groups, they believe in this concept of the old ones. But they're these preternatural intelligences, sure. That, which, which I was like, this is too much, you know. After finding all the stuff that we found in Penny Royal, to come across this and to find out that this group, who truly believed that there were these beings and that they were performing time magic here in this area to prevent these intelligences from penetrating our reality, it was crazy. But she's really the reason why. Kenneth Grant believes that, and she believed it because the Cherokee also have stories about this. Apparently, something happened that was horrible enough to cause the Cherokee tribes to kill all of their priests in one night. And that's a thing that has popped up again and again. And, you know, I, I don't know if it's related to this specifically, but this idea of that, that gateway over top of Kentucky, but it's so strange how it lines up with the whole Kentucky anomaly research too, right? That here you have the largest spike of geomagnetic energy in the Western hemisphere and a story about a rift in space and time that is allowing these things to come across. So it's weird. It's just weird how it lines up, you know? Yes. Yes. Well, we're off to the races now. <laughs> So I also wanted to step back to a weird little story that you talk about in the first episode. Uh, I guess it would be called the Kentucky Meat Shower of 1876. One of the weirdest things that I have heard in a long time. But tell people about this as an example of the kind of anomalous stuff that seems to happen in this area. Yeah, so... The first time I'd heard of it, well, obviously, if anybody's familiar with Charles Fort and Fortian Phenomena, you know, the Book of the Damned, New Lands, he records a lot of stories about skyfalls, which is the proper term, I guess, you know, but falls of fish, falls of frogs. Those are sort of the common things. The most uncommon, obviously, <laughs> probably in the history of Fortean phenomena is this story from Olympia Springs, which is the first time I heard about this. Olympia Springs, Kentucky. And I forget the name of the couple off the top of my head, but this is, I think, late 1800s. And they were in their backyard, and suddenly there was this rain of meat from the sky. And so there, there were these large chunks 
of meat, what they identified as meat. And they couldn't explain what it was or what it came from. Their neighbors came over. I think it rained for like five or ten minutes steady. So there was a, a large amount of this meat. And so, strangely enough, some people tasted it, which I don't know if I would have been so bold as to taste meat that had fallen from the sky. But these people tasted it, and they said that it tasted like mutton. A lot of it was lost to time, but a piece of it was actually kept at Transylvania University, which it ends up being the place that I went to college. And I didn't even know at the time, I didn't know that they were in their special collections that they actually had a vial of the Kentucky meat shower wow. um, that they preserved. And if I had, I, God, I would have gone there. But I, at the time, I guess I just wasn't doing a lot of this research, you know, 20 years ago. And so it was fun to find out that it was there at my alma mater, you know. But I had known about that, obviously, from research with Fortean Phenomena. But while I was talking to Dan Dutton here in Pulaski County and we were talking about the strange things that happened, you know, on Highway 39 and in the area of Campground Road, I mentioned the Kentucky Meat Shower. And that's when Dan was like, well, we've had those things happen here, too. You know, that there have been frog falls and meat fall from the sky. And his parents had told stories about this happening in the early 1900s. And it's just another one of those strange things where you're finding out about the Kentucky anomaly and these Adena mounds and this weird high strangeness and portals and gateways. And now someone's telling you, well, there's a long history of weird shit falling out of the sky here in Pulaski County and definitely in Kentucky. And there's just no denying that that a well-documented meat shower is something that's hard to not, you know, hard to <laughs> hard to wrap your mind around, right? Yeah, for sure. I've always been fascinated by those sky falls, as you say. I think that's why Magnolia remains a pretty decent movie on my list, even though the rest of it is kind of slow. But have they ever figured out what that is? I mean, the best conventional explanation, which isn't even good, is that tadpoles would get sucked up in the water cycle and then fall from the clouds later, I guess. But have you ever heard of a better explanation for that? The accepted explanation by scientists, which I don't believe this, I'm not on board with this, but the conventional theory is that a flock of vultures, and vultures apparently vomit often in flight, and so the thinking is that they had killed something and eaten carrion, and as they were flying over the farm, the entire flock began to vomit the meat that they had eaten. And that's what this is. You know, that's the accepted, that is the accepted view to explain this by wow. science. Swamp gas, swamp gas explanation. Swamp <laughs> gas. Yeah. Well, you know, the other interesting thing too, is this idea of star jelly, right? Yeah. And God, uh, there was a book that a guy wrote. I wish I now, now that we're talking about this, uh, I'm like, oh, I wish I, I could remember the name of it, but it was about his attempts he believed that there were these weird creatures that lived in the upper atmosphere. And he would go up in a hot air balloon and attempt to find them. He, apparently, he says he did find them, that he's seen them with babies, and they look like these see-through amoebas. And ever since I knew about that story in that book, I've always thought, is it just a dead one of those? One of those exploded in the sky somehow, you know? And that's what this is. But who knows, man, you know, like it is strange. I mean, it's just one of those weird things. You can also think of like a portation when an object drops out of the air and that that somehow this is related to that. But I don't know. I just think it's another one of those weird things that this area is just rife with those kinds of things and weird spatial distortions, weird time anomalies and all of those things just, I don't know. It's just, why do things like that cluster in places like this? I, I don't know. But definitely, I think the meat shower is, and the skyfalls that have been reported here, especially, are just a part of that phenomena somehow, you know? Right, right. 
Well, as interesting as stuff from above is, I am always fascinated with stuff from below. And you mentioned the Hopkinsville Goblins, a story from 1955. It's probably one of the most well-known weirdness stories from the area, but in the effort of leaving no child behind, what can you tell people about that particular story? Because it is quite weird. You know, I'd say most people know the story of the Sutton Farm in Hopkinsville, that they saw a light in the sky, and then for the rest of the night, this family was besieged by these tiny little goblin-like creatures. And the strangest thing, though, which doesn't sort of jive with other stories of alien encounters, that they actually came into conflict with these creatures and were shooting at them. And so whenever they hit one of them, they would spin in the air, and there was a sound as if the bullet hit metal. And so that's a strange detail I've always thought was weird. But I would say this is one of the most documented, if not the most you know, widely accepted actual encounters with something strange. There were so many witnesses. Law enforcement was involved. You know, they ended up having the sheriff come to the farm. He sees all of these shells. Like, they obviously were shooting at something. They at least believed something was attacking them. And so that is the origin of the term Little Green Men. It comes from that encounter that ended up in the paper. Now, there's a belief that these creatures that were encountered, that it could have been a UFO crash of some sort. And so they came to the farm, they encountered the Sutton family, and then they go down into a cave on sort of the backside of of that family's farm. And, you know, as you kind of spin forward, there was this idea that maybe they entered the Mammoth Cave system that stretches Mm -hmm. all the way across Kentucky and somehow have existed there, you know, and increased in number possibly. And then obviously people that are familiar with Hellier or any of the sightings of, and not just Hellier though, there there are stories of these little creatures that come out of caves, this idea of Tommyknockers in the coal mines. People call these things all kinds of different names, but it's really fascinating that that's sort of that very early UFO encounter also is tied to a number of sightings with sort of caves in Kentucky. And also, I will point this out, that is the only UFO sighting slash encounter that is officially reported by the CIA. The CIA sent a guy named John Mulholland, who was a stage magician, to investigate and file an actual report on the Hopkinsville Goblin encounter, which is totally crazy. Yeah, it definitely is. And I wanted you to lay that out so that we could mention what happens in Hellier, because for people who haven't seen the Hellier series, it kicks off with a similar story from 2012 of a guy who was so desperate for help with this kind of situation He reached out to a local paranormal investigation group and said that these little green creatures were coming out of a mine at night on his property and tapping on his kids' windows and just generally freaking them out. And that show, Hellier, is a wild ride that, for me, I didn't really feel like it ever really reached the heights of that first episode, and I don't feel like it really stuck the landing, but that story is still super interesting, and it turns out that both places where these goblin creatures emerged 57 years apart, are on the surface in different areas, but they are both connected underground by that mammoth cave system, right? Right, yeah. And see, the thing, too, about Somerset, Pulaski County, because of the karst geology here, we have what's called the Sloan's Valley Cave System. It's the 13th or 14th largest cave system in the United States, and it actually connects with the mammoth cave system, you know, in, in different parts. All of this stretches eastward all the way to the eastern tip of the state where Hellier is, the town of Hellier. It's actually a suburb of Elkhorn City. 
Hmm. I love it, man. And in terms of evidence, there's also, in at least some of these cases, three-toed footprints the next morning when people come out to investigate, right? That's something. Yeah, man, and that's the strangest thing, too. I mean, obviously, that's what Hellier focuses a lot on, these three-toed footprints. If anyone has read The Rebirth of Pan by Jim Brandon, who is really William Grimstead, (laughs) who is a very controversial character or author. I've heard you say that before. Would you mind elaborating on what he said that's so controversial? I just find myself like a moth to a flame attracted to the word controversial and what might be hiding behind it. Well, I mean, this is part of what's come out in our investigation, too, of Penny Royal, which is kind of, it's just crazy how all of this is connected. But I've always been fascinated by, in a fond fan and reader of James Shelby Downard, sort of the grand old man of conspiracy theory. I think a lot of people that talk about ideas like mystical toponymy and synchromysticism, all these things, and a lot of people don't realize that it goes back to Downard, Mm -hmm. right? And there's this idea that possibly Downard is a literary invention, And that he was the literary invention of Michael Hoffman, who's a very well-known, I hate saying conspiracy theorist, but, you know, I guess, you know, he is a conspiracy theorist. But For lack um, of a better term, yeah. Yeah, you know, but Michael Hoffman and also another gentleman named William Grimstead, Bill Grimstead. Now, Bill Grimstead, William Grimstead also wrote under the name... Jim Brandon. So he wrote um, a book called Weird America and then also this other book, which became a big part of Hellier, called The Rebirth of Pan, which covers, you know, all this stuff about, you know, Grimstead as Jim Brandon was in Kentucky quite a bit. And this is another one of those things, you know, I'm a huge fan of Downard. I'm digging into this. And then suddenly I find out these guys were here, you know, here in Kentucky, that Downard lived and grew up in Kentucky, that Downard went to college 30 miles, 40 miles north of Somerset at Center College, right, in the 1930s. And so you find out that William Grimm said he, he's the guy that created this concept of the Lafayette factor, or the Fayette factor, that places with the name Fayette, like Lafayette or Fayette County, which is where Lexington is, all these different places that there's this inherent weirdness attached to that name. And so then he goes into this whole idea of power names and and this idea that there's an ancient sort of spirit to the land here in America. And then he talks about the three-toed footprints and how those relate to this idea of the green man, of Pan, of Sunernos, you know, the horn god. So anyway, all those things are fascinating. They're it's meaty material for Fordian researchers, anyone that's interested in high strangeness. Well, he's writing these books as Jim Brandon. When you dig into who William Grimstead is, you find out that he and Hoffman were part of the American Nazi Party and that these guys were Holocaust deniers, that Gr- Grimstead was the editor of and Hoffman, too, were working, pushing some very racist ideas and very anti-Semitic ideas. Mm. And I think that's one of the things, too, that the idea of King Kill 33, that JFK assassination may have been some type of killing of the king ritual, right? Which is a fascinating thing to think about and the symbolism that's attached to it. You know, you've definitely talked to people that, have, you know, are familiar with that. And a lot of your listeners are. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people, you know, when you think back to Downard, when he published that article, you know, Michael Hoffman was the co-author and really, I think, probably the author. And then Grimstead is involved in a lot of the publishing. He's the co-author in a lot of the Downard material. So it's as if they're using Downard, whether he existed or not, which is another thing that we're working on there nonetheless exists this undercurrent of fascism, you know, and anti-Semitism and racism that 
is part and parcel of their beliefs about this, quote, spirit of the landscape, right? That I think has to be taken into account when considering their ideas of high strangeness. Mm -hmm. So it's just one of those things that I think you have to address it. Definitely the second season of Penny Royal, when it comes out and we've got most of it done, it deals with that. It deals with our investigation of Downer, but you know, you have to address those things. You keep finding those things. And I think you have to talk about those things because you don't want to give a platform to those underlying ideas because obviously Grimstead and Hoffman no doubt believe that the ancient culture of America, right, that, that, that laid the foundation of all this mysticism was an Aryan group. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's fascinating, man. I'm telling you, it's, it, but also it's like I dig into this stuff and then I find out that Downard is in Fort Thomas, Kentucky, you know, that that's where his family was really located. At. It's strange, too, that this isn't in the podcast, but, you know, that's where – the most famous murder in American history up through the 1800s happened. That was the murder of Pearl Bryan, where Bobby Mackey's is, where they decapitated this girl. There's hundreds of ballads about this. And it all took place right where Downard is, right where this bastion of like high strangeness is. And then again, he went to school here, like 30 miles, 40 miles north of Somerset. Here's this guy. Right in the center of all the weirdness, you know? Yeah, that is wild. And I figured it had to have something to do with race because what else would be that uncomfortable to talk about anymore? But hey, living in the conspiracy world, you're going to deal with these kind of things. I will say that too, that that's one of the things Penny Royal, when I started working on it, it was back in, it started in 2017 and really the recordings began in January 2018, right? At the time I was interviewing all these people, none of the QAnon stuff, none of the ideas of like Pizzagate, at least, were really prominent. And as I neared the completion of the podcast, and there is that weird cult element to the story that's undeniable. You know, that's why I tell people it's like we're not making it up. I mean, it's a real thread of the folklore here this idea of these cults, right? And I was terrified that I was going to release the podcast in the midst of this environment, media environment, and that QAnon or an extremist group would latch on to Penny Royal and then use it as evidence that kids were being held in the caves in Kentucky, you know? Uh, I, I guess that would be a valid concern, actually, now that I think about some of the material that you end up getting into. And on the subject of cults, there is a part where you talk to a woman named Pamela Richards, who says she was brought up in Pulaski County and was brought up in a cult when she was a child. Apparently, during some ritual events, she was covered in blood, she was given drugs, she was taught to sacrifice animals alive, and she would hear their screams at night. And on at least one occasion, she claims human sacrifices were made and their bodies were cut up and taken to the mouth of a cave by kids in a ritual procession. I mean, these are some pretty hardcore claims, but she is not the only one saying stuff like this, is she? Yeah, so that was... For me, that was the turning point in the whole, the mystery, you know, the Penny Royal mystery, you know, let's call it that. I started researching all this stuff because when we moved down here, I was driving around the town square. And it's kind of a, a circle that you go around. And there was this group of people with these signs that they were holding up towards City Hall. And the signs said, you know you did it. And so I thought, what in the world is this? This is crazy. So I get back to the house, and I'm talking to my neighbors, and I'm asking them, like, hey, you know, I saw this, like, really crazy group of people downtown, and they've got these signs, you know, what's going on? So they tell me about these murders, these unsolved murders that happened in 1994, very high-profile murders. Dateline came here. In 2019, it was the 25th anniversary. 
It was Linda Gibson and Cody Garrett. And she was 21. He was four and a half. He was her half brother. And they were last seen on the 4th of July, 1994, getting into a car. And then they were found three days later, mutilated on the city limits. And it's a really, really strange case. You know, anybody can look this up. But like I said, it's been covered by some true crime stuff and Dateline. She actually lived down the street from us. And the place they were last seen is literally around the corner from my house, right? So they're telling me the story. They're saying that it's connected to this cult here in town, right? That there's this cult. It's an eyes wide shut sort of motif. It's the upper crust, the the patriarchs of the five richest families are part of this thing. And it goes deep into, the, you know, that they're having these sex parties and there's drugs and ritualism. People are in robes. And I thought, this is absolutely bonkers, right? Like, there's no way <laughs> not to not, not to say anything disparaging of the area. But I was like, you know, there's no way these country bumpkins are worshiping some type of elder gods or doing anything of that sort. Right. And I just thought, you know, there's no way. And definitely in um, researching this deeper, I found out that the story I was originally told was actually an amalgamation of three different murders here in town. Now, the two that we're talking about are definitely, they absolutely happen, but they tie into a whole other, like a separate weirdness. But anyway, I found out about those. I heard about those stories tied to this cult. And I, for the most part, once we had dug into researching it, had decided there's no cult. That this is just local rumor, sort of sort of this like Twin Peaks, you know, element to how people think about things. You know, the people in power are doing these terrible things to people. Mm-hmm. Well, that's when the Hellier crew shows up. So Greg Newkirk, right, comes comes to town. He knows Kyle Cadell. There's a friend of mine who runs the, this is strange too, you know, how many towns have a paranormal museum, you know, in them. And so here, here we have Kyle Cadell and and there's this international paranormal museum and he would go to these conventions and he ended up meeting Greg and Dana Newkirk because they also were on the convention circuit. And so after Hilliard had come out, they'd contacted him. He had talked to him a few times and they said they were in the area and They came by to interview him just about Kentucky. He didn't know they were even shooting the second season of the show. And so they'd asked, you know, is there anybody else we should talk to? And he told them that, you know, you should talk to Nathan because he's researching all this stuff. He's got all this, all these stories, all this folklore about the area. And so they contacted me and we met in our studio above Jar Club Brewing. And (laughs) Greg asked me about the weird stuff. And so I told him all the stories of high strangeness, all that. And he said, well, what do you think is going on? And I said, let me tell you about the darker stuff, right? Let me tell you about the crime. And so I told him all the criminal stories, some of the stuff I just told you, but other things too. And that's when he, (laughs) that's when he told me that they had been contacted, that no one knew this, but that they had been contacted by a woman in Somerset telling them that there was this cult here and that they were, killing children and all this just totally crazy, just the crazy stuff. But what he was telling me was the same stuff that we had heard from Pamela. And there were three other women with the same stories here in town, right? Now, Pamela did point out that there was one other woman that had exactly the same memories as her, but they both shared the same psychiatrist, which is suspect. This is exactly the time of the satanic panic. And I'm not saying that nothing happened to Pamela. I mean, obviously she suffered trauma. You know, that that was the one of the most difficult things to record of the show. And something that I had never tackled before was sort of the ethics of how do we approach, you know, because that was definitely a part of the folklore. And here was someone that really wanted to tell us her story and how you handle it. Because it's very sensitive material. And like I said, she absolutely believes those things happened to her. But anyway, Greg Newkirk is telling me literally that there's a woman that I don't know that I haven't interviewed that has contacted them, telling them the same story 
about cults and green men and all this crazy shit. Well, that scared <laughs> that scared me to death, man. Because then I thought, what if we are, you know, for me at that point, it was kind of still fun. And we were like looking at all the local crime and the high strangeness. And then he tells me that. And I think, what if there really is something going on here? And what if we're poking our nose in it and we shouldn't be? And so that definitely freaked me out. And they left, you know, and after that, I, I told Darian and Kyle, you know, who are the co-producers on the show, that maybe we should just stop doing this. Because, like, I have zero interest in trying to solve murders, right? Leave that to the police. And we did sort of let it cool down for a while. But it's just one of those things that we looked at it again and we couldn't stop looking at it. And honestly, talking to, you know, that was what was so weird was the intersection between Hillier and Penny Royal was so strange. Because I was working with Dan Dutton this very well-known artist in America, but also a super famous Kentucky artist on a documentary about an experience he had while making one of his operas called the fawn about pan. Right. And I'm filming a documentary with him about an experience he had in Elkhorn city, Kentucky, where he feels like he encountered the archetype of pan. And then Hellier comes out and it turns out that Somerset is actually like the last half of the show of the second season. And they are researching Pan. You know, Dan Dutton's opera cycle, his four part opera cycle, which is really famous that KET filmed, is called The Secret Commonwealth. And the episode that I'm in, the eighth episode where they really reveal all the Somerset stuff, it's called The Secret Commonwealth. And so in Dan, where he had this encounter in Elkhorn City, you know, that we're going to reproduce artistically his opera, his dance opera in Breaks Interstate Park to see if we can invoke that experience again for him. Not really to summon Pan, but in a sense, summon Pan in an artistic way, right? And that's the finale of the film. And then the finale of Hellier's second season, they attempt to perform a ritual to summon Pan here in Pulaski County in the caves, right where all of this weird shit has been happening, centered in that part of the county. And I was just like, this is totally nuts. And I texted Greg that morning and I'm like, dude. I'm working on this film with Dan Dutton. And that's when Greg says to me, he texts me back. He's like, I'm looking at Dan Dutton on my wall. He didn't make it into the second season because I just didn't know how, he, how this guy that was so tied to Pan fit into all of this. And it was just one of those weird things. It's like, no matter what you think about their research or, or what we're researching, it's an incredibly strange intersection of it's just beyond coincidence that they came from Hellier, Kentucky, which is Elkhorn City. It's a suburb of Elkhorn City to Somerset and ended up trying to summon Pan in a ritual in a cave. And that Dan and I, unbeknownst to them, were working on a film where we went to Elkhorn City, Hellier, to restage his fawn opera to invoke Pan. And it's just so strange, you know? I mean, outside of all the other stuff, it's like, <laughs> that's incredibly odd, you know? Right. Well, when you read a lot of these books and articles from paranormal high strangeness investigators, they often find themselves being part of the mystery. They get hit with so much synchronicity that it feels like something is leading them along. And it seems like <laughs> you felt that as well. And to... Talk about some of the lighter stuff again. The goblins are obviously very fascinating, but there's also another weird one in episode two where you talk about a couple who saw some sort of manta ray creature undulating or sort of swimming through the sky, but it was also transparent. They could see stars in the night sky through its body. That is pretty out there. 
man, that's probably one of the, my favorite stories of this area, right? That's an official MUFON report that was submitted to them. God, it was it 2005? I can't think of the uh, off the top of my head, but I think it was 2005. But it was recent, you know, in the last 20 years, 15, 20 years, that, yeah, a couple in Burnside, which is just five miles south, like Somerset sort of stretches into Burnside, you know. And Burnside's one of those old towns that when they built the lake here, that's the other thing that's here in Pulaski County is Lake Cumberland, which at one point was the largest man-made lake east of the Mississippi River. So Burnside was one of those towns that was flooded, and they ended up moving the entire town up to higher ground, which is kind of fascinating. The town itself is still underwater, and so if you dive under the lake, you can still see the layout of the town and all the streetlights. And there are all these crazy ghost stories about the people seeing in their boats beneath them the streetlights coming on, which I love that story. You know, but it's just you know it's folklore. So Burnside, that's where they saw this this couple had come home, and I think it was after midnight, and they saw in the sky this flying what they described as a manta ray creature, you know, UFO that they could see through and see the stars and that it was undulating flying through the sky. What's fascinating about this is that those same sightings are reported on the West coast of the United States frequently. And there's a farm in the Northwest. God, I can't think of the name of it. But the guy guarantees that you're going to East Seti. Is it the East Seti Ranch? Oh, James Gilliland. Yes. Yes. James Gilliland. Yes. So one of the hosts of Coast to Coast was, it might have been Jimmy Church. Or not Jimmy Church, but I think it was one of the guys that was on Coast to Coast had a sighting while at the ranch of one of these flying manta rays. Which, that was the first time I'd ever heard of it was on Coast to Coast. And then you find the same type of sighting reported to MUFON here in Somerset. And it's within one mile of a place called Alien Grave Mountain, where this guy claims in 1963 there was a UFO crash. And it's totally nuts, man. It's a totally crazy story. But I, I love that. That's one of my favorite sightings of anything ufo or sky creature and see that harkens on what we were just talking about the, the idea of these translucent things in the upper atmosphere you know was it a ufo was it a living ufo or was it one of these creatures that had come down too close to the earth yeah you gotta wonder and so you end the series asking people to look into their own places where they are and find the mystery of their place. Have you gotten any interesting feedback in that regard? I mean, definitely people have been, I think that resonated heavily with people, which it should. I mean, I'm going to mention this. I mean, I hope it's all right to mention this because I talked, to Tim, uh, <laughs> I talked to Tim Renner about this a bit on strange familiars, right? Because I think Richard Spence, who did Agent 666 and Empire of the Will with Walter Bosley with the San Bernardino murders, I mentioned this whole idea of like, is this stuff happening everywhere? And Richard Spence was sort of the mindset, yeah, it is happening everywhere. It was happening in my town, it was happening in San Bernardino. And when I talked to Tim Renner, though, about this, and we were talking about folklore and the connection between people and place and looking at your own hometown, he mentioned that he had done an experiment about whether or not you could just pick a random town and find all this stuff. So he did that experiment, and he didn't find anything. And so it's like... I think everyone everywhere should dig into their town and find that folklore and find those stories that form this sort of underlying strata of what makes a place interesting, but also what 
makes that place influence people. You know, people don't realize how much folklore influences their own personal identity because you are sort of where you live in a way. And also that place is what it is because of you and the stories you tell and the stories that everybody tells that lives there. Right. And so there's this weird interplay. And so I think anybody, wherever you are, if you're listening to this, you should dig deeper into where you live because you're going to find, you're going to find something interesting. Are you going to find something, (laughs) you know, I will say, I think there are very few places with as much weirdness as this place. And I think that's what Timothy Renner was kind of saying is that there are certain places like Toad Road or Skinwalker Ranch, where it's like those places are these concentrations of high strangeness. And I think this is one of those places, but you can't find that. You don't know where if you are in one of those places until you start asking those questions and you start digging and you start looking at where you live because ultimately, you know, where we all are, there are fascinating things. And I just think people should value folklore more and value understanding how the place that you live in affects you and how you affect that place. And that's why Penny Roll, the tagline to it is the magic and mystery of place, because I just think that's a worthwhile thing to engage. Yeah. Cheers to that, man. Well said. I do agree. Having done this show for 10 years, you kind of start to try to think of creative ways to cover things. And one of the biggest hits has been to do deep dives with local researchers about the place they live, whether it's Phoenix, Arizona, or the Susquehanna River, or Philadelphia, for various reasons, people who just have the eyes to see can pick up on a whole lot of amazing stuff. And, you know, let's just add this to the list. I mean, this was a great one. And Kentucky, of all places, one of the few states I don't know if I've ever even been to, just pretty crazy. And I do think with some of the weird possible Nazi ties, it's like, where do you go to do this stuff when you've been blown up so high on the radar You got to go where nobody is. You go to these compounds in Argentina. You go to the middle of (laughs) Kentucky. It's crazy, but I think that strategically that would make sense. And for us to be learning about that a few decades later wouldn't be the weirdest thing in the world. So I think you did a great podcast series, man. It was really fun to hear all the various interviews stacked up the way you did it. Solid production value. Before we go, anything else to tell people before we call it in? You know, get the podcast wherever podcasts are found. You're doing a season two. What else do you want to tell them? Yeah, um, yeah. Season two is going to be coming out September the 21st. It'll be done this summer. We've got a Patreon called The Liminal Watch, but you can just look us up, Penny Royal, on Patreon. Find us. Secret Facebook page is part of The Liminal Watch. We're doing all kinds of research on random number generators. And if you listen to the podcast, like there's a lot of stuff that we're researching because we do all this data science to test some of these theories about cybernetics and about observational qualities of magic and things. And really, we're just all digging into this mystery together and All of our research, all the newspaper articles, all the shit we've gotten from the FBI, like CIA documents, like everything we've come across, everything we've found, we're providing it to this community and they're giving us. And we've been doing this for since November, you know, so God, it's been fantastic, man. So if anybody wants to help us dig more into this and try to dig through all these documents and understand the mystery of what's happening here on the Penny Royal. Definitely check out our Patreon and check out the website and hopefully they'll tune in for uh, season two. There was just so much that we couldn't include in season one. That was part of the mystery that it just gets weirder, man. The, (laughs) the, The longer we look at it, the weirder it gets. 
Amen, man. My business is weird and business is good. So <laughs> you put on an awesome show. I am psyched to see it continue. And I had a blast talking to you, man. Hopefully we can do this again. But keep doing what you do out there and tell the cyst guy I wish him well. <laughs> for sure, man. Dude, thank you again so much for having me tonight, man. I'm totally, I mean, I love the show. Been a long time fan. And, and also just thanks for having me, man. It's fantastic. So, too kind. My pleasure. Well, enjoy the evening, man. Have a good one. Thanks, man. You too. Mountain Mama. Yes. That was certainly a wild ride. High strangeness in the Penny Royal. Meat showers, goblins, portals, subterranean cults. What more could a person want? I honestly just never really knew much about this area. I've never been to Kentucky, but the more I think about the landscape and the Mammoth Cave system and the foothills of the Appalachians, the remoteness, the large amount of quartz crystal, it's a pretty perfect place for weirdness. I do like doing paranormal episodes or things that get into cryptids, but sometimes the stories are just so similar that you feel like you heard it before. But <laughs> with this one, I think we were able to highlight a lot of stories that don't fit the typical mold, like that old Kentucky meat shower of 1876. I can't get over that one. And of course, the Hopkinsville Goblins is a wild story, as is the very similar story that kicked off the Hellier series. And when that came out, a lot of THC fans wrote me and said, dude, you gotta watch Hellier, it's right up your alley. But I don't know. For me, I was a little underwhelmed. I loved that first episode, but after that, it just didn't feel that exciting. It started to feel like your typical paranormal investigator's show to me. Stretching things to make them more interesting. Really straining to shoehorn in some synchronicity. This is what happens in the studio production process. But we did have Alan Greenfield on THC around the time that Hellier was coming out. And even though his secret cipher of the Euphonauts is a big part of the show, his book is really great, and it stands on its own, and it sits right in that sweet spot of occult summoning of quote-unquote alien beings blurring the lines as we like to do. Man, I thought that was a good book, and Alan was a great interview. As was Nathan Isaac. I'm pretty happy with the show today. Big thanks to him. Great show to release just a day after my birthday. How about that? What do I want for my birthday? I want messages about strange experiences and wild theories at thehiresidechats.com slash voicemail. I'm going out of town this weekend, but I'm coming back, doing that joint session before March ends, and I need those messages. Content is king, people, and for the joint sessions, that's really whatever you decide to uh, send my way. What else would I want for my birthday? Oh, I don't know. I guess I would just want you to treat yourself to a Plus subscription. How thoughtless of me, right? What a guy I am. But I also wanted to mention updates and additions to the THC forum. I just added groups, so people are able to form their own groups now, which I think will help some people form connections in the community better than just forum threads. And I added the live chat rooms as well. So. One of them, you can just pop in and just talk to whoever's there. And one is going to be accompanied by the WTHC 24-7 radio live stream. And that, in my mind, makes for a good prompt for conversation and an interesting live group listening experience for THC, which is kind of a new way to do the thing. I'm spending more time there. I think it's pretty clear it has improved a lot in the last 60, 90 days. And it's going to keep getting better because I really think that that's probably the next step for this thing. I'm going to do the same show I always have done and people are here for that. But I also think it's important to network and come together with like-minded people, particularly in this time. So I want to make it easy for you guys to do that. I figured let's just do it in our own system rather than jumping from platform to platform. Ugh. But yes, I'm trying to get this chat up. I 
can see it on my screen, but I might not have configured it correctly because I put a few test messages in there and nobody's responded. So it must be hidden for non-admins, but I did say in there, the first person to respond in that chat room gets a free THC shirt. So the fact that no one did, I guess probably people can't see it yet, but keep an eye out on that. I'm going to go through the settings, toggle things left and right, you know how it goes, and uh, it should pop up there, and then someone can claim that prize. But yes, Nathan really pulled together a lot of great stuff for season one of his Penny Royal podcast. Not only paranormal activity, but this weird life of Alexander Duterma, this guy who beneath his cover story might have been an ex-Nazi officer. I don't even think we talked about this part in the interview, but apparently at one point he flew to L.A., drove out to Roswell, kidnapped a baby and took it to the Philippines. And that was before, I think, he was charged with the largest stock manipulation in history up to that point. And then he gets out of jail and buys a mine in rural Kentucky. Okay, <laughs> just wild. And then I think it was in the Plus show, but Nathan mentioned he would tell me a little bit more off air. And yeah, <laughs> there's a decent amount more to the story. And I hope he tells the rest of the world in season two, but it is not my place to say. But if you're only hearing the first free hour of the Higher Side Chats, you're missing half the show. Sign up for Plus, throw me a few bones, and get yourself the full THC Plus experience. Just in this episode, we talked about the Oakwood Clinic's occult activities, the channeling of the Nine, MK Ultra, and the abuse of clairvoyance and seers what Nathan has learned about magic, the connections between binary and divination, that really blew my mind, and <laughs> a real contender to the meat shower story, the back cyst ball bearing incident. You plus people know what I'm talking about, but I always try to keep my interviews action-packed, focused on the material, they're always commercial-free, I want to make the best show I can for you guys so that it's worth the price of a subscription and we both win without any advertisers. So help me help you. You get access to the private RSS feed. You don't have to listen to the show from my website. You can use most podcast players like you're doing right now. Anyway, the very top link in your show notes should take you right there. But I suppose that's a wrap. Really wild stories interesting area. Who knows how an area gets weird to begin with, but it's certainly stacking up in Kentucky. Take care, guys. Much love, and thanks for listening. I've done my part. Your move, cave goblins, meat showerers, and paranormal portal openers of the Penny Royal. Your fucking move. Woke up this morning with light in my eyes And then realized it was dark outside It was a light Coming down from the sky I don't know who or why Must be those strangers That come every night Whose saucer-shaped light Put people up tight Leave blue-green footprints That glow in the dark I hope they get home all right Hey, Mr. Spaceman Won't you please take me along Beer. My toothpaste was smeared. I opened my window, they written my name. Said, So long, we'll see you up again. Hey, Mr. Spaceman, won't you please?
Won't you please take me along the high side?